Okay, I'm back. Okay, so just in terms of what we're covering uh, in this session, just to give context into the CA program, I think the, the target audience today is um, chartered accountants and uh, people on the CA program. Uh, so we'll cover the context of our unique challenges being in the CA profession. Also, the anatomy of an article itself, you know, actually producing a research publication as well as the peer reviewed publication process. I think that those two are actually important in terms of getting an insight um, as to how to devise a strategy uh, when we are actually looking to, to produce more research. The other thing that we need to look at is the drivers of research output and what actually impacts our research output. And normally, you know, when we, when we ask staff, why aren't you producing research? The, the primary reason that we get is, you know, we don't have time to research or the, our teaching workload is too high. And that is uh, acknowledged, but I think that's not the only problem. I think there's much more many problems or many more problems than, than just um, our workloads. I think there's more issues that we need to carve out and dig out um, in actually analyzing, analyzing the root cause of research output problems. Um, also developing strategies. Um, as to how to actually overcome our obstacles to, to research output. And I'll give you some context into my own journey into, into producing research output. Um, during my uh, short research career, um, I have had strategies that worked and I've had strategies that didn't work. Um, and I'm gonna share that uh, with you guys today because I think you know we all learn more by sharing. You know, I think the more we can share with each other, the more knowledge transfer we have, the better it is and the more competent we are um, as a collective. Uh, whether it be within the university or you know with you know in a, in the country itself, uh, the other thing is we look at is a research plan, and I think this is quite important um, when you're trying to actually chart your your future in terms of research, because you actually want to have a, map, a roadmap. And for most things in life, we do have a roadmap. Research, which typically carries for you know a totally credentialed staff member, forty percent of your KPA, um, many researchers don't have a plan. Uh, so there should be a plan. A guiding, um, you know, sort of document that you use that's personal to you, that makes sense to you um, in terms of what you want to achieve over the coming years. And staff members within the the CA program in universities, um, the teaching and learning expectations are stringent. I think we all know that Psyca has very, very high quality standards. And of course, the quality of the program cannot be compromised under any condition. The syllabus, I mean, is tremendous. Um, I think we all know the syllabus. Um, in Saika is quite a look at the 2021 CA 2025 competency framework. You've probably seen how much of volume and depth there is uh, in terms of the, the teaching and learning outcomes or the competency outcomes of the program. So we all required to, to actually comply uh, with SICA's expectations, but at the same time, we also required to research uh, and to credential as a university requirement. And the old adage of having two masters is, is one that comes to mind when we, when we look at the statement, because we have so much of research to do at the same time, we also have to, to comply with the strict quality standards uh, that SICA sets. <clears throat> as, a talk, as I said before, I think the curriculum changes on CA 2025 are gonna be significant. Um, They've already started to infect, and they're going to be more and more impact of this uh, changes coming through in the next few years. I think we're going to see massive amount of changes, uh, especially when you look at the PVAAs, when you look at the enabling competencies. Um, I think modules will, will start adjusting, and there'll be more and more uh, change in the actual curriculum itself, which means more time for us uh, to spend on the program and means less time for us naturally um, with the research. So given our our existing workloads and the formidable challenge of the working environment, given the syllabus that we have to cover and the quality that we need to deliver at, you know, how do we still maintain our obligation to the university, which is basically to, to try and promote or increase our research output and our value as a researcher. The other thing that, I, that probably needs to be mentioned here is that our trajectory as an academic, you know, if you want to become a professor or associate professor or senior professor, full professor, it's, you know, it's highly unlikely you're going to get there without research. Um, you know, there, there is talk about a specialization route where you can be a specialized teacher um, or a lecturing route to becoming a professor. That's still in the pipeline. And even if you are going to do that route, they still want research in teaching also. So either way, you can't get out of research because even if you are on a teaching specialization route, uh, which some universities are now considering, you would still need to actually research teaching. 
um, as part of your evidence or your portfolio of evidence for promotion. So it does look like in either way, we always have to research uh, to get promoted um, in any university environment. So just to get you know more context into what um, an article is, and I think many of you, many of us have actually published here. Some of us haven't published here. You know, there's many different parts to an article, and you know, people say an article is such a big thing. Some articles are 15 pages. Some articles are 20 pages. Uh, some articles are 30 pages. Some are 10 or five. You know, every article does have its own. Every journal has its own uh, specific criteria. But in in generic terms, there's always um, an idea, a concept, a generation, or an introduction which follows an abstract. Um, and that concept is probably one of the most important parts of the article. Um, if you have a valid concept, idea, generation, that's going to be your first uh, major breakthrough in the article, probably the most important one, getting an actual idea that's you know, technically valid and that has research uh, relevance. The second one is obviously stemming from that idea and generation of an introduction. We now articulate what the research problem actually is and what our research question is from that. Um, once we have the problem in question, you'll see that the article then moves into objectives uh, as to what we actually want to achieve um, from the research paper and the approach, the research approach that is going to be used to actually test our assumptions and to actually find the answer to our question. And that usually involves, in terms of methods, a literature review, uh, which is almost universally accepted that you do that uh, in every journal. And once you've completed the literature review, that will give you some level of findings or evidence um, and some partial solution to your question. But of course, you, then you go further and empirically test it, uh, which you used, which primarily comes out through qualitative testing, through an interview or through questionnaires or the quantitative model, which is uh, using statistical models and mathematical models to actually test a hypothesis using secondary data. So that's the fifth leg of the transaction. And then the sixth part of the, this entire transaction, which is writing a journal article, is a discussion and conclusion, which is basically trying to actually discuss what we've actually found from our results, and then concluding um, on the actual questions that we had up front. And this entire sequence of events can actually be broken down. It has been broken down in the past between different authors. And that's why we have so much, so many co-authored papers. To, for one person to do the entire system is onerous. Um, if you want to go alone and do this entire, you know, six-step process by yourself, um, you know, you need to have the time constraints, you need to have the capacity and skill. Um, and I know I've done it on my own. Um, I've, I've published research on my own, uh, doing all of this on myself. Uh, it takes a lot of time. Uh, it's a lot of, lot of work involved. And it is so much easier if you are able to collaborate with other staff members, uh, either in your university or even outside your university. Um, if you're able to get research assistance, even better. But the another value um, that I that I picked out from this anatomy is that we can clearly see that there are certain sections to every article. And if you are um, systematic, you can actually start to say, you know what, the concept of idea is mine, uh, the introduction will be mine, the research problem and question is mine, and the research objective and approach is mine. The literature review, maybe I'll get someone else uh, to work on that after I give them clear instructions on what to do. The empirical testing or can also be done by the same person or someone else. And of course, I can conclude on it. It makes it a lot easier. If you've got co-authors, even better. You've got other academics working uh, with you to create um, your own masterpiece, your own research masterpiece. Because in the end of the day, it is a piece of work uh, that is validated externally uh, by a, a journalist accredited. So at the end of the day, if you're able to do this, you know, you have validation that your work is up to standard, up to par, and has been validated externally and, in, and internationally. So it really is something to, to think about is not just that I need to do the entire article. I need to do can't come up with certain parts of the article and how can I collaborate to get this entire project done? Because this also comes down to project management in a certain way, because if you project manage really well, it's, it's highly probable that you're able to produce more and more projects and get more projects completed because every research article can be regarded as a research project. Right. Now, just looking at the peer publication process, I just want to underpin how rigorous this process actually is, because I don't. I think some people don't really understand how detailed 
um, and difficult it is sometimes to actually get published, especially if you're targeting a Q1 or Q2 journal. Um, you know, the initial phase is just to, once you've completed all, uh, all of your work on the project, on the research project and finished your article, uh, you're probably gonna submit that uh, using uh, the electronic system for most journals have that now, where you submit it electronically to a journal. And of course it goes to various phases in the journal uh, system itself. So once uh, it gets submitted to the journal, you usually get an editor review on this. Uh, and having been involved in certain journals and, and being on the editorial board of one or two journals, I know that the editorial review is a high level review. It's basically to test the scope of the, of the article, the length of the article and the appropriateness or relevance of the article to the journal itself. Now, if you don't meet that, if your length is too far on words, that means if the, the article was six, if the article limit on the journal is 6,000 or 6,500 words and you, you're hitting 8,000 words on it, it's immediate send back to you. It's immediately gonna be uh, rejected by the journal unless you fix it. Um, the scope of it is very important, getting the length, getting the actual relevance of the article to the journal itself. The journal objectives and aims should be understood before that. The editor, uh, editorial review is there to test that. Um, and then the appropriateness of it as well. So they look at high level research methodology here, um, as well as evidence being used in the study as well. And, in, and you could get an outright reject on this on high level review upfront, or you, you could just say, fix this, 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 and then I can send it for second uh, review. So once the high level review is done by the editor, um, it goes to a second level review normally, um, and that usually tests the completeness of the information. It does go more detailed. Uh, some, some journals actually combine the second and third level review together. So it's not that this is fixed uh, for every journal. Every journal has their own approach, but this is what I've seen in many journals. Uh, where they do test uh, plagiarism, they do test the formatting, the completeness, the style, the abstract, everything, and they look at it overall. Right, so it's slightly more detailed than the, than the first level review of which the editor and scope test. And of course, once that's more or less okay, it goes finally to a full blown uh, technical research review, uh, where they will go into every single um, test that you've done on the on the journal work, on the research work. And of course, once once that's done, they give you detailed feedback on your article. And once you've got detailed feedback on your article, you then need to you know clear those queries coming through from the journal. And if those review queries are not resolved, the paper is rejected. And of course, if it is cleared, then you're going to get an acceptance on your on your article. The timelines can be for some people depressing. Um, it can be as quick sometimes as three months. I think that's really quick. Um, but as long as three years, um, you can you can take that long to actually publish. I've seen. Uh, some papers which go on for years and years uh, in terms of when they were actually published. So it is um, a very, very, you have to be very, very patient uh, process, uh, patient in this process. It's a long process. So when you look at actual research output itself, um, we just have to understand that it's just not about one factor that's Im impacting the research, your research success as a researcher. Uh, as an academic, you have many, many demands on you. And I understand that fully, those of us who are in the academic environment understand how much of work we have to do. So naturally, our success in a particular field is impacted by multiple factors. Um, the first one I'll talk about, of course, the obvious one is our actually capacity to actually research and have actually time to research, time capacity and teaching workloads, because we do have to lecture and, tut and tutor, et cetera. And we on a CA program, which of course is demanding, which has a lot of um, demands and quality in terms of syllabus coverage and content and scope, it is very, very wide. Um, so those do impact our timing um, in terms of how much time do we actually spend on teaching. Um, and that affects obviously our time to research. So that's one factor. The other factor is that even if you do have the time, you might not have the funding um, to actually publish. I mean, you, it's, it's a tragedy that in some cases, in some universities, we, you know, sometimes there is no funding to actually uh, produce a paper or to even present at a conference uh, made available. So, you know, you could do the work you could do the, the research presentation for your for your conference, but you might not actually have the funds to actually go and present at the conference or even pay the attendance fee at the conference, you know, because you don't have the funding in your personal research account, you don't have a research account, or there's no cost center in the school or the department that you're working in to actually fund these drives or initiatives to actually encourage uh, research success. A third one, I think, which is extremely important is our own psychology and motivation, because I think our psychology is critical to our success. Um, no matter how many times you get hit down, no matter how many times you get rejected, uh, you have to keep on pushing. 
that is seems to be the only alternative to getting success. Um, I've had papers rejected. Uh, I've had, we've had full professors have papers rejected. I think every researcher at some point in his career is gonna have a paper that's come back with a lot of queries. But I think the how you take those queries is really important. I mean, whether if you take those queries in a mindset that I can learn from this and make me a better researcher, then it's all good for you because you learn in that process. And that's why the growth mindset is probably one of the most important things in research because you wanna learn as much as possible. I remember speaking to um, a colleague of ours in finance, number one researcher in our school, and I even spoke to him today. Um, and he had told me previously, you know, that, you know, he loves the queries that come through from a Q1 journal. And why does he enjoy it so much is because a Q1 journal is the highest level of, of research, um, you know, quality you're going to get. And you can get the most stringent queries coming through from a Q1. If you can handle a Q1 um, journal queries and clear all of those queries quickly and get it published, you know, you, you're likely to, to be able to publish in most of the other journals quite easily. And, and he, the reason why he enjoyed it so much is because he learned so much in the process. He enjoys learning and making his articles of high quality. And that has resulted in him now being producing so many different uh, research outputs that in fact, he's one of the, probably one of the best, uh, highest research output producers, not this, I think this year and probably, uh, you know, we can expect that probably in future years as well, uh, given his trajectory. So, you know, the growth mindset, his psychology, is what drives him as well. It's also hard work there, but also the psychology that, that helps him succeed. Now, one of the things that you know also impacts research output is your supervision level. There's no doubt there's a direct correlation between supervision and research output. If you're not supervising, it's like, basically it's an important leg to, to generate research as part of a normal supervision process, which can lead to output quite easily. It's a very, very important thing to leverage on. If you're supervising, uh, staff members, that research definitely can be converted into a research article for publication. So it's something that we need to, to consider. The more and more we research, it's not just about supervising staff, which is also part of our, our KPA uh, in any case, it's also about using that supervision experience and research to actually produce research output. The system that we work in is also important. I think the environment that we work in is an environment where you know staff members are collaborating, uh, are willing to work with each other, or is it everybody work in silos and, you know, to stick to themselves. Because the more and more, I think we can have sessions like this where we, you know, we share with each other, the more and more collaboration will start to happen. So, I mean, I'm hoping in the future to also have more sessions where we just talk to some of the top researchers in our school and maybe other universities as well, just to get the insights on things and just keep the ball moving, uh, you know, the momentum swinging forward because it's important to keep our inspiration and aspiration up uh, in this process. And getting a collaborative environment uh, definitely helps us to, to actually produce research. We need mentorship in the environment. We need, uh, you know, professors are willing to mentor uh, up and coming academics. And if you have that in your school uh, or in your college, it's always, you know, it's up to, to you. If you're a up and coming researcher, it's up to you to take the initiative to actually seek those, those mentorship opportunities. We need to identify who are those top researchers, who are those professors you want to, to publish with and actually go out and do it. Um, there's no two ways about it. The initiative comes from you. Um, these people who are already producing articles, you know, don't usually don't actually do uh, come out and you know open their hands and say, you know, please join me. Uh, many of them actually this are so focused on their own work that they actually don't have much time uh, to go out and do training and so on like that and so and, and things like that. Um, so you have to approach them. You have to go out and actually look for them. The skill level of staff also important to develop your own research skill. As you become more and more skilled the more, more competent you become, uh, the actually better the chance is of you actually producing quality research and improving your research output. So for each of those drivers are put into, into play some strategies that you know, we can use um, to a certain degree in certain contexts for success. Now, in terms of our workloads, um, and I know we've got two or three universities in here today, it just depends on each university, but from a university funding perspective, we're looking at is there relief available for our teaching work or tutorial work? And if there is, how do we use that effectively to actually build capacity for research? Uh, and if you can do that effectively, then basically we're now uh, utilizing a, an effective strategy that has worked for, for many people. Block teaching is this, uh, an innovation uh, that has happened in the teaching and learning space that can be used to your advantage. Uh, if you can even do block teaching for two weeks or three weeks where you're not, you don't have to lecture for those three weeks straight, 
you can get some tutorial leave maybe for two weeks or three weeks no consultations for that period and you can just block yourself up for those two weeks it does help um and i've helped some people get to some block teaching even in the tax discipline years ago and they've done quite well in, in credentialing so if you can work in credentialing you can also work in research the other area to look at is guest lecturing um, where you can get outside people to actually help you and that helps sometimes with your capacity you know sometimes to prepare for a lecture can take a long time this is a complex topic pgda level or third year level even second year level you can take your hours to prepare for that um, and you can spend four four hours five hours on that on the topic on presentation time contact another three hours so you know if you get a guest lecture it does help to a certain degree uh, in terms of your hours and something to look at and there are people in industry who do want to come in and guest lecture Ad hoc lectures is the other way of doing it, where you pay for um, ad hoc staff to come from outside your university to come to come and actually uh, lecture for you. It's not the ideal thing. Universities don't like it too much, but if 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 there's a noble aim to it in trying to to get more research done, then sometimes you know the end justifies the means. So you can actually get it. Funding, uh, in terms of of um, in the school. I think there's incentives for, for particularly at UKZN, we have a lot of incentive for, for research. Uh, you still get your PUs if you do get to publish. Um, I'm not sure whether that's existent in every other university, but it definitely is an incentive for us to, to research. Uh, and you have to explore those incentives. Getting to the pool, uh, if you don't have a research account, I know that in, in particularly in our university, there is incentive for up and coming researchers uh, to even have uh, certain uh, research grants, um, small research amounts being allocated to them so they can use research assistance as well. I think that was approved at management, management committee levels. So there is incentives in certain schools. And of course, you want to partner with researchers who are successful and have strong research fund accounts because they can fund a lot of stuff. Uh, if you're partnering with a research, um, with a senior researcher, then they have a lot of you know funds in their account and you do a paper together, you know, they might be willing to actually use part of their fund to actually send you for a conference or to actually get your papers you know, evaluated externally um, and even help you with the publication process um, if need be. So there's a bit, definitely benefits to actually exploring what, what research incentives are available and partnering with people who do have you know, good research uh, fund accounts. Uh, on your skill set side, you have to leverage on whatever skill set you already have. So for many people who have their master's, uh, whatever skill set you actually got in your master's, doing your master's, uh, that's important. Uh, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, you can you already have something in the bag here, which you can use to publish. Uh, those skill sets are important. You have to develop new skills as we go on. And, you know, for many of us in accounting, I think we were qualitative researchers almost by design. Um, so, you know, doing heavy stats and regressions and analysis became quite tough for us, but it's something that we have to learn. Uh, we don't have to learn the entire thing. I don't think we have to be, you know, savants in, in statistics or mathematics, but we do have to understand how it works in a broad, from a broader perspective. Uh, if we can understand broadly how this thing applies, what it's trying to do, what it's trying to achieve, uh, I think we have the we have the ability to actually publish. I've seen, you know, my research mentor and supervisor, uh, Professor Bass, you know, he was a qualitative researcher as well. He wasn't, he was very similar to what he taught me was qualitative research. And in his, um, and in his research output, you'll see quantitative and qualitative. You know, you'll see both regressions and you'll see qualitative research because he partnered with a lot of uh, statisticians and mathematicians. He didn't understand the entire detail of every model, but he was able to understand the overall view of the model and what it does and what it's trying to achieve. And as long as you can understand that, I think um, you can definitely leverage on uh, people who are outside your skill set. And probably we need to do that to get a mix of our publications. Uh, training sessions are also important for skills development. Um, whatever skills are acquired, whether it's mixed method, qualitative or quantitative, whether it's software development in terms of using, uh, you know, Stata or SPSS uh, or eViews, whatever you, type of software you're actually using and you want training on that, uh, that should be, that's a request that needs to be made, you know, into your, in your school uh, for that training to happen as well. Supervision, I think one of the most important things to start just to get your confidence up is to co-supervise. I think this is a very, very important research skill uh, that, that develops as you see what your co-supervisor is raising and you start to learn from that as well. People who supervise a lot of PhDs and masters, you need to actually join them in supervision. Uh, it's a very, very nice way to start developing from a base level upwards. Um, of course, you have to supervise an area you're comfortable with. You don't want to be supervising something that you're completely out of. Um, and your student quality, and selection you can have it actually 
if you have a lot of students applying for masters and phd you can actually you know choose the highest quality students uh, that you want um, to supervise and that's a good thing uh, because you want students who are willing to work on on the research as well so it's a mutually beneficial relationship uh, both of them both of you succeed in your endeavors from an ecosystem perspective you need to actually look at your your ecosystem your environment who are the top researchers and what is the willingness to mentor um, collaborate with them and those who have evidence of publication as well and you don't have to collaborate with only academics in your university you can collaborate with any academic um, I'm collaborating with, with, with academics from other universities. Um, and the reason being is that they have, you know, specialist knowledge or skills in a certain area that I like to publish in. And they are the ones you can partner with in doing that. So you can collaborate on ideas, not just in your university, but with any other university, not in just this country, in any, in any country. That's the beauty of research is that it's so wide. You know, we, we don't realize what a gift we have in that we have the ability to research and collaborate with anyone in the entire world. You know, that's the reality. Um, and there's so much of skill to be learned from anybody else in the world. So, you know, as academics, we have that um, duty to do, but it's also a gift in a way for us to learn from, from so many, you know, great academics around the world. Our psychology, as I said, this is equally important. We need to have a growth mindset to learn from our mistakes, be willing to make mistakes, be willing to get those review, tough review queries, be willing to learn along the way. Be willing to, to get your ego down, forget about your ego, be humble again and say, I know nothing about this and I need to learn everything and open my, open my mind up to everything that I need to know uh, because this is a completely new space for you. And once you learn the space, you know, it's, um, it's what they call, it's an asset as uh, we do have a few accounting people here. It's an, almost like an intangible asset that you have for life where you can actually now, uh, you know, use that in the future. So I'm just going to summarize some of the strategies that I used, um, you know, in my research career. Um, and some of them, you know, worked well, some of them didn't work so well. Um, so the first thing, I mean, is to obviously leverage on the work that you've already done. And that worked well for me. So, so when I started my journey, I finished my PhD in 2014. And I was able to, to work through articles with him. I was fortunate that he was quite an experienced, um, you know, researcher, he published over 70 publications in accounting. And uh, he was the NRF, NRF chair of accounting. So he was a very, very experienced person. Um, and he was able to, to supervise me quite well. And I was able to get, you know, um, most of my dissertation or most of my thesis, in fact, uh, published. So the first part of college actually will work with your, with your supervisor or co-supervisor and, and look to, to publish what you've actually done in your existing research, in your master's or in your PhD. That's a really good base. And it gets you into the doorway of actually journal publishing. And it's something we, we need to do. Um, if, you, if you're still doing your PhD, another option for you is actually to look at uh, the article basis of PhD, which is article format. It is um, slightly shorter than the, the full book format. Not the normal book format is, is 300 pages plus normally. Article format, you can get away with about 180 to 200 pages. So you can actually you know, cut down your, the amount of work that you have to do as well, provided the work becomes publishable. Um, the other thing that I try to do, of course, and you know, after I publish all those articles, the question is, how do I actually now, from being a lecturer, start to try and increase my research output? Um, is to start extending topics and varying, and varying topics from from my uh, initial PhD uh, to to vary it here, vary it there. I was doing carbon tax at that point in time, and I, I started to vary it with you know with um, corporate governance, CSI, uh, and that type of uh, that type of areas, research areas. And I did have some success in it. I did have, you know, limited success in it, but not all the success that I wanted. Um, so it wasn't, wasn't the best thing. Um, I always find that, I think finding a fresh idea, a new idea is probably the best way to go. And not just keep on varying, um, you know, initial research uh, objectives from your thesis and start, you know, looking at it in another country, for example, or looking at another context. I think this gets exhausted at some point. Uh, all the information that's there, gets reused at some point. So I used this to, to some degree um, after my PhD and it didn't really work that well. Um, I, I would say my hit rate probably 50% in terms of getting articles published there. Literature based studies also limited success. There's very few, there's not many journals with this except literature reviews, there are, um, especially the, the legal ones. So for those in tax, you know that we a lot of the time we look at tax law and um, tax law, the research approach on tax law is doctrinal research, where we looked at the legal way of actually publishing. And of course, those, if you look at legal journals, I've read a lot of legal articles, 
and they actually don't have um, you know any quantitative work in it. There's no testing on it from that perspective. Something there's no there's no even questionnaires in it. Uh, to tell you the truth, all there is 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 the legal analysis and the case law judgment uh, by the judge and your and the view of that, and you analyze the view of that. So that is another way of publishing. Um, and um, I did have some success uh, with that, but limited success as well because finding the journals that actually do that are a bit more specialized uh, than your normal um, volume of journals that I have available for publishing normally. Uh, collaboration with other staff members in other disciplines this worked really well. Okay, so I started in my journey, uh, when I initially finished all those articles that I published in my PhD, I started to work on my own. So I did publish like two or three articles this self on my own. And then thereafter, I found that it's becoming very tiring to, to spend so much of time, you know, uh, producing an article on your own, the one article. And I found that we, at some point in time, we just need to work with other, other staff members and uh, research assistants. Um, so collaboration did work very well in terms of working with other, other staff members uh, in general. That's something I recommend. Uh, research assistants, uh, limited success, because in some cases, the research assistant, you know, uh, will help you and get, get the stuff done, but the quality is something that the research assistant also needs to deliver on. So I would say this is this can be a very, very promising, very, very good uh, strategy, provided the quality of the research assistant is good. Uh, if you get good quality research assistants, you can definitely have a lot of success. Um, I'm putting a limited success because I had one or two cases where the research assistants weren't working as well as I wanted them to work. Um, and then publishing with uh, students on the thesis and dissertations that also worked really well. So that that's definitely a good strategy um, for you to use if you are supervising a master's or PhD. Planning research outputs in advance works extremely well. Planning what you want to do, what research projects you want to engage in, um, you know, two years ahead of time or one year ahead of time is actually something I recommend to do because I've done it and it worked. Um, so definitely something you want to have in the pipeline. It doesn't always work out as planned. I mean, you can have two or three projects that you plan to, uh, to publish and, you know, something goes wrong. You don't get the assistant, you don't get the staff member to help you, or, you know, the journal takes a long time to come back to you. So nothing ever goes according to plan 100%, but, but a plan is definitely something you want to have uh, when you want to increase or improve your, your research output. Some of the strategies that don't work are not feasible. I wouldn't repeat publications in the same journal. I've had one or two in my initial, in my startup career, when I was emerging as a researcher, the, the first thing I published was about two, two articles in the same journal. Um, and that's not recommended. Um, and the reason being is that when you do repeat publish in the in, in same journal, it actually, you know, doesn't actually help you in terms of your promotion or, you know, your scholarship, because they see it as basically the same journal over and over again, and there's no new reviewers of that. Um, the more wider your publication net, the better it is for you. So, you know, from about 2015 onwards, 2016 onwards, I decided, you know what, I'm not going to do that anymore. And just move into as many different journals as possible. Um, so now I try and publish in, in new journals every year almost. Um, predatory journals also, just be, be careful, uh, beware of them. Um, they're normally easy to, to publish in, but they don't actually improve your skill level because there's not much review in that. So I don't recommend uh, predatory journals. Um, I have published in one or two predatory journals and um, they don't give you the level of feedback that you want. Um, and basically they can become deaccredited, in which case you actually do get uh, penalized because you don't get your PUs after that. So it's not a thing you, you really want to do. Um, you want to publish in, in Q3, Q2, Q1 journals. Uh, and when you're starting off at Q4, I think. Uh, so basically those are the journals you should be targeting. And then sometimes producing papers without contextual knowledge. But I've seen some researchers who just, you know, produce research for the sake of research and not having any knowledge whatsoever on the subject at hand. They got, they can, it actually got different assistants working on different things. Uh, one doing the introduction, one doing the, the research problem and the literature review, another doing the empirical testing and conclusion. So, but you yourself don't have the, the knowledge, you're not in that field, you don't have enough uh, background knowledge to actually understand uh, the basis of the research. Working as a sole research author, I don't recommend this because this takes a lot of work, a lot of time, and this is the resource time. I think if you want to develop your research skill, you can start with it, but this, remember it's going to take a long time to, to, actually, to, to, to actually succeed in. Presenting at conferences is good uh, because it does actually you know, uh, get the, the, the ball moving on the research. It also gets comments back on your models and your, and your type of research and your methodology, but with no follow-up effort on the research that you presented thus far, you won't get very far in publishing it. So when I used to speak to my, my supervisor, he always told me, you know what, 
um, I don't actually present at conferences. Um, you know, the, the, the research supervisor himself, you know, my PhD supervisor, he says, I don't because I just want to publish the article. And, you know, for me as well, I think presenting at conferences is, is good. I think once a year, maybe I, I do that. But apart from that, the focus is only on publishing and getting it out. So it's good to, to present at conferences, but if the follow-up effort is not, you know, corresponding or following that, then you, you're not actually accomplishing much. Such as that did work, of course, mentorship, always important, collaboration, uh, very important with people in your department, other universities, self-development in terms of your training skill and your technical skill, uh, supervision needs to be improved, virtual assistants, writing a research strategy, virtual assistants are internet assistants who can help you with literature reviews, so it's not just your postdocs uh, and people who can who are studying um, for their masters or PhD, you get them now online as well who can help you and do that, and writing a written strategy, writing what you want to accomplish. I just put timing strategies in as well because I think this is also important. Um, because people want to know, you know, what are the top researchers, how much time do they actually spend in a week researching? Uh, when do they actually research? And there's no fixed answer. You know, everybody has a different way of, of producing their research. Um, one professor I spoke to, this is his the first approach, the first strategy here is from him. Um, so he allocates uh, early hours in the morning uh, when his mind is very, very fresh. He usually starts around, I think, six o'clock in the morning. Which is quite early, <laughs> well before normal time. Um, and he goes to about half past eight, nine o'clock, I think, every day. So from six to half past eight, six to nine every day, pretty much is what he spends on research. And the rest of the day is to teaching and learning um, and leadership, if he has any you know, leadership responsibilities. The other way of doing it, uh, which worked for, you know, pretty much okay for me, I think, uh, because my days were always full of meetings and, you know, I still get meetings just about every day, um, was to, to use the Friday afternoon, because generally it's a bit more quiet then. Uh, and the email... Uh, the email quantity, um, volume of emails coming through is a bit lower on Friday afternoon. So we usually try and push, you know, a few hours of there and then go goes into either Saturday morning or to Monday morning. And to get some hours in there, you can probably get a few more hours there, three or four hours more on a Monday um, or Saturday. And then the third one is from another uh, researcher, professor, full professor as well. And he says there is actually no allocated hours during the week for research. You know, he does, deals with it on a project by project basis. And I think this is also a very, very good strategy. Some of, something for us to look at is that each research article is looked at as a project and there's certain timelines associated with the project and you project manage. So you have to, you know, get certain parts of the project done by certain time period. And if it means two days next week, um, be the Friday and Saturday to push that out, we'll do it. Uh, he's willing to do it. He's he's willing to spend the entire weekend on it. So, you know, he's got a different level of determination. Not all of us are going to work our entire weekend doing research, but that's his approach. And um, it's been working for him. Um, and that's what he uses in terms of getting his, the important message that he sent to me was, it's very important to keep the momentum of the project going. You want to make progress on the project all the time and try and get it completed by a certain point in time. You don't want to let the project die. As long as you make incremental progress on a project every week even, it, it means the momentum the momentum is now being kept up alive. And you want to do that all the time with your with your projects. This is one research plan that um, give me a sample of in terms of, of topics. And obviously the topics means that you'll have to go into uh, the research itself in something that you like to do um, and you want to do. And those topics can be generated either from your own research, uh, what you've been doing in your master's or your PhD, or going into other journal, journal articles that interest you and you're fascinated about. And also look at the future research opportunities that come out. Because remember the last part of an article usually has a discussion and conclusion section, also has recommendations for and future research. And that's an area where you can look at, we can easily leverage on that by just going to that last page of the article and looking at what are the future research opportunities for this? Because this is a topic you like, you wanna do it. What? How do I take it further? What's the next level for this? And that's one of the ways you can actually generate a topic um, you know, quite quickly. Um, and of course, when you once you've done that, the, the plan is then how do you actually, you know, go about planning your research out? Um, what journal are you going to look at? You know, you got to target your journal because appropriate journal with the scope uh, aligned to your topic. What method will you use to test uh, the data and where do you get the data from? Right? And like I specify which what what type of data, what type of method I'm using, what data set am I using, where am I going to get the data from? What's my team like? Um, is it a, is it a co staff member? Is a research assistant? What's my timeline on this project? And it's almost about, almost like project management in a way, um, where you're trying to actually get your topic done. You know uh, where you want to publish it in. 
Uh, you know what method you're using, you know where the data is coming from, you know what the person's going to do on it, what you're going to do in it, what everybody else is going to do on it. And then it's a matter of executing the project uh, and getting it done, uh, you know, literally. So in conclusion, I just like to say, there's no you know, singular research strategy that will work for everybody. I think everybody needs to choose the strategy that works best for them. Um, but I think inevitably long-term research skill development is non-negotiable. You will develop your research skill as you get stronger and stronger in research. The value of mentorship is critical, even for experienced researchers, even guys who are associate professor level, full professor level, they're still being mentored, even a, on a research basis, because there's so much more to achieve. You know, um, so publishing in these high impact journals, Q1 and Q2 journals, people who have published there, those people generally are the people you want to approach uh, for mentorship because they've they've gone through the most, some of the most stringent uh, requirements in publication. So it's very, very good to, to have that experience, you know, around you all the time. The state of mind also needs to be ready for ups and downs, um, almost an equanimity of mind, a tranquility almost, where you can actually, you know, balance yourself out and say, okay, I've got a lot of research queries to do, but at the end of the day, this is for my own growth and for my own knowledge and competence. And in the long run, this will serve me well because what it makes me stronger. You know, what doesn't kill me makes make me stronger. And that's the state of mind you actually need um, when you're going about this journey uh, of research. So I'm just going to stop recording there.